very special guest with us this morning, missionary Eddie Gunter. He's a missionary to Mexico and probably many other countries uh, from what I'm hearing, and uh, we're excited to hear from him this morning. Uh, we know this, that our preacher only trusts this pulpit with people that he trusts, and I know that this is a dear friend of the pastor's, and uh, y'all give him a good welcome. And uh, pastor, preacher, come on, missionary. You're still a preacher. <laughs> missionary, preacher, it's, it's, all, it's all the same. Thank you, yes, God's called us all to be a minister, an ambassador, representative of the king. If you're in children's church, you can be released now. <laughs> <laughs> Release from prison. <laughs> It's an honor to stand before you this morning and give an account of what's going on on the mission field, plus address the church in the absence of Brother Eugene. First of all, i got to correct one thing that happened this morning. All of the humor was spiritual and out of the Bible, and it did not come from Randolph. <laughs> if it was political or something like that, it come from Randolph. <laughs> So we have to pray dearly for Randolph. <laughs> it's an honor to stand before you this morning. Uh, first of all, my wife and I would truly like to thank you for uh, being one of our supporting churches. If it wasn't for churches like y'all, uh, we would have to come off the mission field because all I am is just a plain country boy, born and raised here in Henry and Patrick County, raised, born in Henry and raised right much in Patrick, lived most of my life in Patrick County. But... Uh, God started dealing my heart to shut my construction company down and go to third world countries and across the United States building churches, children's homes, Christian schools, and helping churches that needed help trying to keep our churches. Uh, we help pastors with their homes, trying to keep our pastors out of debt. When you keep a financial bind off of your pastor, and you don't know how much that helps when he's standing right here in his pulpit trying to reach the loss for Jesus Christ. There are so many things we could tell you about, but uh, he asked me if I could speak today, and I, uh, he asked me over a month ago, and I said, Brother, I cannot tell you right now. I said, I'm scheduled this week for Mexico, but it happened to where we'll be leaving Wednesday, going to uh, Spruce Pine, North Carolina, meeting with part of our team, then driving to Atlanta, Georgia this week, and then flying to San Carlos, Mexico. In San Carlos, it's a village of 4,600 people, uh, not, a, not even a Catholic church there. Uh, we're trying to go in there, and uh, uh, Baptist Association out of uh, California sent a missionary there some 11 years ago. It didn't amount to anything, but they did purchase some land, and they're going to give it to my group if we'll build a church there. So we'll be going looking at the land. My wife will be uh, uh, we're working in a vacation Bible school in Las Planas, where we've been for two years now in a row. Uh, where we took 84 children on the uh, year before last. Last year we took 24 more children on there, and then we started going out and seeing where there was a need for a church, and that's why we found uh, San Carlos there. So y'all remember us. We'll be coming back uh, first week in June. Uh, we'll be home for maybe one day, repack, and then we're going back into uh, Tuscaloosa, Alabama, in the tornado area to see a pastor there help do a vacation Bible school there and speak to the young people, go into the juvenile detention centers there. I told in Sunday school class this morning, uh, last year we had 37, 37 or 39 uh, young people in the juvenile detention center make professions of faith. They done a, we done a follow-up on some of them. They got out of the detention center. They found local churches, and they're in churches, and that's what we need to hear we also give statistics this morning of so many, uh, the great drop of the number of people that's going away from our church. And this thing should not be in a day that we live with all the modern equipment, technology we have to get the word of Jesus Christ out to a lost and dying world. These things shouldn't be. But that's where God's called us to go out. 
Uh, I've told y'all before it's not about building these buildings, even though buildings are needed for the uh, service of Jesus Christ, especially to our missionaries that don't have people to come in and do these things. I'm going to speak to you this morning on a, a subject that most of you people know all about, and that's SEEDS, S-E-E-D-S. I was leaning toward another message, but God just would not let me get away from this. I even come in from yesterday working on my daughter's home. My wife stayed there and took care of our grandchildren, and I was started a message uh, that was not this one, but God just made me come back to this. The people, most of the people in this area are farmers, or being farmers, raised on a farm, and they know what seeds are. Farmers take and go out and they pick the very best grade seed they can possibly buy if they want a good yield. They are uh, uh, they after the most yield uh, at harvest time, and that's where their profit is. They fertilize these seed and take care of it. Ladies pick out number one thing they pick out is flowers and they want the best plant they can possibly find, the most beautiful plant. And this uh, uh, plant is to produce a beautiful flower. The people, there's another seed that we're going to talk about today, and it's not one that a lot of people like to talk about, and that's the seed of bitterness, the seed of hatred. And these things right here are like these other people when they pick. Uh, we don't want them to turn out like they do, but they will, will produce a big yield, a, a, a whole lot more than you expected to when you started planting this seed. The seed we're talking about this morning uh, uh, was planted, and it lasted about 10 years here in the Bible, and it's in Second Samuel. If you go to Second Samuel 15, verse 31, and one told David, saying, Ahipothel is among the conspirators with Absalom. A conspirator is that's where the seed started right there. Anytime that you go against the will of Jesus Christ. But here, Absalom is David's son. He was against his own daddy. And uh, uh, Ahipothel was uh, a counselor, a man wise, a friend to David. In fact, if you read all the contact, you'll find out he was his best friend. But he let a seed get started in his life that he held on to for 10 years. And it's, it's sad to say what happened through it all, but uh, uh, when he was giving advice, uh, counsel to Absalom, uh, a hip fail in uh, verse 21, said unto Absalom, Go into the father's concubines, which he has left to keep the house. His daddy had left the country with his mighty men and his numbers and left the concubines in charge of the house. And that's like another man coming into your house with your wife in control, is basically what this says. He was to bring shame unto David. And he was told to do this. And uh, in verse 23, and the counsel of Ahipophel was the can, uh, which he counseled in those days was as a man had inquired at the oral of God. So was the counsel of Ahipophel both with David and Absalom. You ever seen a, uh, a fence straddler? That's what it's saying right here. He was giving counsel to David and to Absalom. He was against one and for the other. You can get in trouble when you do things of this nature. Uh, you're talking out, of, uh, as the Indians say, with a forky tongue. You're talking out of both sides of your mouth, and these things are very dangerous. It says in verse, uh, chapter 17, And moreover, Ahipophel uh, said unto Absalom, Let me now choose out of 12,000 men, and I will arise and pursue David after David this night. And, it, uh, and I will come unto him while he is weary and weak uh, handled, and I will make him afraid, and all the people uh, that are with him shall flee, and I will smite the king only. So his seed was very personal here. 
He wasn't interested in smiting the armies or the other people. He said, I will smite the king only. So this has got real personal here. People, watch how you sow a seed of bitterness. Uh, I've seen it across the United States so bad of uh, families with seed sown in families that split families. My wife and I have seen it. We've seen it. But I have to uh, be honest with you. I, I, my family is as guilty as anyone. And if you get out honest, in your family you've seen bitterness sown, the seed of bitterness sown. And when you reap your product from bitterness, it hurts. It hurts. And it'll go carry you further than you wanted to go and cost you more than you wanted to pay. So these things are very important. A seed of bitterness will grow, and like other seeds, it will produce a crop. Now, that's a one thing about it. It will produce problems. We treat bitterness and hatred like we treat a new home, a new car. We keep it. Bitterness, uh, just like tilling the soil. The more you till the soil for your crop, the better it will produce. We keep our uh, cars and house all shiny, and, and people will notice these things. People will notice bitterness and hatred when it comes into your life. And these things, as God says, should not be, even though it happens. Uh, and here's David considered uh, Ahipophel as a friend, a close friend, a counselor. For you to be a counselor in these days, you had to be high on the pedestal, lifted up, well thought up, and as a friend here. But people, we run into so many things here that uh, causes problems. Uh, in uh, verse 7, there was another counselor. Uh, Hushai said unto Absalom, the counsel that Ahipophel is given is not good at this time. So you've got two counselors here that's working against each other. That's what we run into when we sow seeds of bitterness toward a brother in Christ, sister in Christ, family, or whatever. It can be even a person that's not even in the family, not in the family of God in your church. And you sow that seed of bitterness, it will show into the public and one thing the public does do, they keep their eyes on you, and they know if you profess to be a Christian, uh, they know whether you're acting like a Christian. As Brother Don pointed out this morning, they know on Sunday morning if you get up on a regular basis and you go to church. They know Sunday night. They know Wednesday night. They know your habits. If you're having uh, this tent revival, y'all getting ready to have, uh, I'm sorry, we're, we're going to be in Mexico during the whole thing, we'll be back a couple of days after it. I love tent revivals. People support your tent revivals. I was brought up going to uh, tent revivals, the sawdust on the floor sometimes just saying, with Pat and I, uh, we've been married 43 years in December. We went back into the mountains. You go back into the mountains of Carolina to a tent revival, the tabernacle back in there, just open shed. And you stand there and let someone's call from the floor to get up and expound on the word of Jesus Christ. And if these things don't excite you, buddy, something is seriously wrong with you. You need to do some checking up. When they start telling about a Jesus Christ that will save your soul and keep you out of a devil's hell and people worry about, oh, man, uh, churches, we're building more churches, more people going in churches. Now, we're building more churches and less people are in churches because of the statistics that Brother Don put out this morning. People, we're, and, it's, and we explained it this morning, it's our fault because we're letting our children do anything from uh, the time they get up to say yes or no. We start letting them. In my house, I was very fortunate. I never set foot in church till I was nine years old. I'm a bus kid, but my daddy got saved two, two weeks uh, after that bus stopped in my house the first two weeks. The second week, my dad got saved, the third week, my sister and I were on that bus. I was nine years old. Until this day, there was never a question whether you would be at church. The children did not have the option say, I've got football practice 
or I've got soccer practice because nothing can come before serving Jesus Christ on Wednesday night or Sunday or Sunday night. These things have crept in. And I, I spoke on a message, things that creep in, creeps into church. And these, this is one of those things that creeps in. But this seed right here crept in to a, a hippophel. And a hippophel, when the second advice uh, counsel was given against him, he upset him so bad because there's been a time period here, a lapse of about 10 years when he sowed the seed. And over 10 years, he has polished it, cleaned it, uh, watered it, uh, uh, kept his soil soft around it so the roots would grow because he was dead set in what he was doing. And I never was much on uh, in the Bible of uh, uh, the gen genealogy uh, chapters, uh, verses where it says this begot that one and that one begot. After a while, it becomes repetitious and really means nothing to you until uh, in the 23rd chapter of Second Samuel where it says, And Elam, Elam, the son of Hippophel, and that right there, I went back to see what was the source of this sad seed. And I went back to chapter 11, and it started with David walking out on the porch on the rooftop early once a morning and looked upon a woman standing, uh, taking a bath, which he had no business out there. He knew the customs of the land, knew that the women went out early in the morning to take a bath. But he looked upon Bathsheba and what it was right here, uh, Bathsheba, Bathsheba's daddy was Eliam, the son of of a hip of hell. and what it was there that David had defiled his granddaughter and through what David sinned to try to cover it up he killed uh, a hip of son-in-law and he let this bitterness seed of bitterness start growing from that point right there on and even in human nature I can look upon what happened right here because I could imagine somebody defile my granddaughters I have no grandsons. We have four granddaughters, and I will fight to my death to protect them. But I hope it never gets to a bitterness, uh, a seed of bitterness planted and sown. And people, uh, this thing happened right here, and here's Bible for it. But what he done, he upset him so bad that the counsel was not followed, and that's in... Uh, uh, chapter 17 in verse 23 and when uh, Ahithophel saw that, the, that his counsel was not followed he settled his ass and arose and got to his house uh, to his city and put his house in order and hung himself and died and was buried he let the seed of bitterness go for 10 years or 10 years plus and what he wanted out of his bitterness come back to him instead of the person he wanted it against. So that's a warning to us how we uh, handle these things. There is nothing wrong if you've got seed of bitterness in your life and you go to someone in your family if that's where it's intended to ward and say, listen, I've been wrong. Is there any way that you can possibly find in your heart to forgive me? But people, that's Bible. But it's also Bible if you just got a brother or sister in the Lord and something has just happened. That's the best time to go to. You say, listen, let's reconsider what happened today and it's better to handle it today. Don't, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. This is Bible. Go to them and say, look, I'm sorry. I've stood in, 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 this past year and listen to somebody tell me something that happened when I was a child and they held bitterness against me for so long that it went 24 years that that's, this person didn't speak to me. And I went to him. I says, listen, explain to me what has happened. And they just reached and took a little bit of nothing and laid it here and made a pile. And they kept reaching and getting little nothings. I was so young, I don't remember these things. 
But after you pile up stuff for so long, your little bitty pile, your little molehill, becomes a mountain of nothings. People, don't let nothings destroy a relationship between you and a brother in Christ or a person, your neighbor, especially if it's in your own household. These things should not be. And God has a remedy for everything that we do, everything that we say. Uh, God will take care of these things. The 10-year period there, I couldn't imagine knowing for 10 years that I had done something to somebody that I wouldn't go to. But in these seeds, let me make one point here. Bitterness, if you plant a seed of bitterness, it's just like planting a cornfield or you farmers know. If you don't go in there and keep the weeds out, keep the briars out, keep the kudzu out, these things will smother you. And that's what happened to a hip of fail here. All of these things kept growing and kept growing and it smothered him out that it was so bitter that he hung himself, died, and was buried. There's nothing no sadder than to say something like that. There's nothing no sadder to set, to walk up to a casket, which we got to do uh, tomorrow with Pat's first cousin. And... Uh, but there's no bitterness in, in the family here that I know of. But if you walk up to that casket, and the person laying in that casket right there, you had an ought against that person, and you did not make it right, these things are dangerous because these things will haunt you the rest of your life if you've got the love of Christ in you. That's the number one thing. One thing we'd want to pray every time I pray uh, I try to close my prayer. God, save that soul that's nearest hell. These are the reasons we're out here on the mission field. This is the main purpose of this church being right here, to reach that lost soul that's nearest hell. It can be what you call a neighbor, the man next door. But your neighbor is not necessarily the man that lives in these next houses here. God said, and it was in Sunday school lesson this morning, go ye unto all the world and tell them of Jesus Christ and what he's done for you, that they may be saved. That's just putting it as plain as you possibly can. I don't know any other way to put it. I told the Sunday school class this morning, I get excited. They're in the Philippines last year on the Isle of Leyte in, in the village of Kananga. Uh, we had uh, 40-some people make professions of faith, load them on a truck, carry them all the way to the ocean, now, they stood on the back of a flatbed truck and rode all the way to the ocean. And this right here is what got me this morning. It's to see the happiness on these two people's face right here being baptized. When we went to the ocean and baptized these people last year, some kids, some old people, man, it lit my fire. I get excited when, over these things. I told the Sunday school class this morning. I get excited over going into the juvenile detention center and have... 30-some people, uh, young people, make professions of faith. I get excited when my wife comes out of the young uh, girls' department there in the juvenile detention centers, and some girl, 16 years old, says, I've never heard of Jesus Christ in my life and accept Jesus Christ that night. And then we go back years later and do a follow-up and see where these people are and they're in church. I get excited about these things. But we're told about a preacher this uh, past uh, April, his mom was 93 years old, and two weeks before she died, he got the leader to the Lord. I get excited over old people getting saved. These, if you don't get excited over this right here, what else in life do you have to get excited about? If you don't get excited about this, check up and see if there's a bad seed sown. Thank you, brother.